R2D2. He didn't hear me. Oh, he heard me. He's coming back. There he is. Ah! All right, all right. Take it easy, buddy. How are you doing? Look at that. Hi. Give a little shake, a little high five. You go for it. Go for it. Bam. All right. That's amazing. <laughs> Love you, man. All right. <laughs> Stop, this is gonna be a quickie, uh Living life with no regrets, I'm gonna be me, uh Didn't believe in me and now they wanna meet me, uh I believe in me, my dream of reality, uh Ooh, baby, I'm the best, I'm the greatest Holy Ghost by my side, no one else's I believe I've achieved all my disguise Ain't no stopping me, as Bobo sucks as watch see Supporting me by watching me quietly. Yo, gonna flash him up and bottle success and see. What's going on, guys? We are here at RetroCon right now and we are on our way getting things signed. So, we got a lot of people here. We got Bob Gurr. We got a lot of good stuff happening today at RetroCon. Look at this. Oh, we got R2D2 running around the back there. Original creator Roger Christian. So we'll just take a walk around and see what we got going on here. Um, just then. There we go. There's a lot of stuff here. Look at this. So we got a lot of vendors that we're probably gonna walk around to, and uh, this is pretty cool, man. Look at that. All the legends signing away their stuff. Oh wait, I got I see Baby Yoda. And we got there we are. Stormtrooper, how's it going? Looking good, man. Thank you. <laughs> this is your whole getup here, or? What me? This is your whole getup, your whole getup? Yeah. Oh, awesome. A lot of retro stuff. How's it going, guys? How you doing? How are you? Not too bad. Wow, you guys got the Sega Genesis, eh? Yeah. Jeez. I'm into all the retro stuff. Wow, that's amazing. I wish I kept my stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, I got anger issues, right? <laughs> See you guys. See you later. So, we got some pretty good stuff going on here. And whoa, we got Catwoman. Yeah. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Not too bad. Loving your costume there. Look at that. Thank you. Yeah, this is a real bullet. Oh, is it? It is. Oh, that's dangerous. <laughs> yeah, I will. Uh, not yeah, I know. Can you though? I can't. Oh, I wow. Can't, but I don't think they would like that. Yeah, no, yeah, that's... <laughs> a little dangerous. Uh, it yeah. is a little dangerous. So that's what got you into this whole uh, this whole thing? Uh, well, 
I've been cosplaying for a very long time, um, professionally about 10 years. Okay. I'm originally from the United States. Okay. I uh, moved to Canada about five years ago. And uh, yeah, I just I love cosplay. I've always loved costumes. Um, when I was like five, I just became obsessed with costumes and it just kind of went from there. That's awesome. So I also do pin up modeling as well. So okay, okay, not cool. just cosplay, but cosplay is kind of like my focus. Okay, cool. Cool. Um, Bunny Bombshell Cosplay. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook. Okay. And yeah, that's pretty much my story. All right. I'm going to put that handle up on there so you can check Thanks. her out, man. That's cool, man. Thank you. Yeah, and here's Look at that. Look, let's, let's check out the prints. This is my animated series Catwoman. Um, this is actually done by DC Comics artist Steve Scott. I used to tour with him in the States. Oh, wow. Um, so yeah, I modeled uh, for Catwoman for him. And these are all of my... Um, autograph prints that I'm selling like photos okay so I have kind of a an assortment I do like anime I do comic book characters sci-fi characters this was done by an artist named Rami Wilson he's based in the United States as well mm -hmm. um, you can find him on Instagram and Facebook That's he goes awesome. by maybe Rami art on, on Facebook um, okay cool and this is done by Ren McKenzie he is also a US based artist this is my Valkyrie um, and yeah, he's, he's also an amazing artist. You can find him on Instagram and Facebook as well. Cool. Well, thank you for your time. That's awesome, thank man. You. Keep up the dream. That's amazing. Thanks. I appreciate it. Look at that, man. That is awesome. That is so cool. Look at that. I gotta ask you a couple of questions for a vlog, man. Absolutely. How are you doing? Not too bad. What's your name, sir? Darren Struhl. And I, I believe you're the maker of this? Yes, I am. That's amazing. So can you tell me a little about it? Uh, it's a scrubber droid that cleans the hangar floors. Mm -hmm. uh, first appeared in episode four, episode one, several of the cartoons, as well as the uh, Boba Fett series. Oh, wow. Amazing. Yeah. So, so you did all the, uh, the the programming I see with all the all the programming was done by myself. Dude, man, he's so talented! Oh my <laughs> god, good for you! I, I saw this like going around. And this. Look at that! So, oh wow, look at the details! Hey, holy. Look at that! Good for you, man. How long did this take to create? Uh, the body was about say two weeks to get done with all the details. The drive system was about two weeks. The programming, about 200 hours. Wow, 200 hours. And I have a wonderful support group through the Droid Builders Club, so okay. whatever I needed, they were there to help me out, to help me figure stuff. Awesome, do you have a social media handle or anything? Like I can... Uh... Unfortunately, I don't. You don't? Um, right? But if you want to check out this, yeah. on Facebook, I just made the page live. You can check out uh, Scrubber Hanger Droids. Scrubber Hanger Droids. Yeah, so it's a page on how to build them, where to get the parts. Oh, I see. Okay. I'll make sure to put that in my blog. Excellent. Awesome, man. Dude, like, that's some amazing. Look at that controller. Holy jeez. <laughs> I see a lot of uh, resistors, uh, push buttons for your different... Yeah, it's just my homemade 15 button system for sounds. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> well, excuse me. <laughs> a lot of beans there. <laughs> nice to meet you, my man. You too. It's a pleasure. Thank you. I'll see you around. Oh, we got our 2 to walk around there too. Okay. Take care, have a good one. R2-D2! R2-D2! He didn't hear me. Oh, he heard me! He's coming back! There he is! Alright, alright. Take it easy, buddy. How are you doing? Look at that! Hi! Give you a little shake, a little high five. You go for it, go for it! Bam! Alright, that's amazing! Love you, man. Alright. Let me, let me get a couple of questions from, I guess this is the creator. How you doing, sir? Not too bad. Can you tell me a little bit about this R2 Dito? I built this one two years ago now. Oh yeah? So it's not the first one I've done, so. Oh, that's amazing, man. Yeah. I'm actually, I'm actually here with uh, uh, Roger Christian, who actually built the R2 D2, eh? Nice. So he'll be amazed to see this little thing. I mean, he's always used to this kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so when you acquired this, I mean, 
What was your uh, motive? Like, is this just a collectible thing, or just a fun hobby to build? Nice, man. So, what? What do you have? A little build in this? Like, did you take care of any parts or anything? Or uh, everything got built. So. so, hang on for a second. So, you're telling me you built this from scratch? Yeah. So, we're part of a group called the R2 Builders. So, it's a worldwide organization. The parts run through there. Some parts machine yourself. Tons of ways of building them. You can do wood, styrene, plastic, aluminum. Wow, you think when, of it, people build them out of it. So do you outsource this kind of stuff? Or is it just a personal hobby thing? Personal hobby. Oh, okay, man. This is an amazing hobby. Look at that. Can you tell me the mechanics about it? Like, I mean, what are you running here? Like, is there... It's all pretty simple RC for the most part. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible. Make yeah. repairs easier. Right. Trying to make things as efficient as possible. Man. Yo, one talented guy, dude. Hey, Holy yeah. crap, man. Look at that. Bye-bye, r 2 2 See you later. <laughs> Take it easy, buddy. That was cool. Some skilled people here, man. Some really skilled people. Uh, yeah, Roger's busy there signing. I'm gonna... All right, might as well get this. Look at this. How's it going, guys? Good, how are you doing, Harry? Not too bad. I'm just doing a little vlog here. Oh, cool, cool. So, tell me something about this. I mean, I mean, you, this is what you guys create, right? Yeah, this yeah. is an iron man. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Look at that detail. Yeah, so Holy. everything on display here from the Venom, Carnage, and all the Iron Man suits over there as well. Yeah, I did see that, yeah. And the Spawn costume, uh, I built them all. Yeah. Yeah. You built them all? Yeah, I built them all. He so, does nothing. He is just, <laughs> he's he's a hype stupid. guy. He, he's a hype man. That's all right. That's <laughs> important, man. It's an important job. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome, man. So what got you into this? Uh, I don't know. I think, honestly, the first Iron Man movie just like blew my mind. And I'm like, I need an Iron Man suit, right? So I started building one. It, it kind of looked, it, it looked like crap at the beginning. This is the third or fourth iteration of this suit. Yeah. So it's, up, it's been up, upgraded a lot over the years, right? I've been doing this for like 10 years. Yeah, man, I can tell yeah, I can the amount of work and detail that he got going on here. Yeah, uh, all the costumes here, they're all wearable. Oh, they are, eh? Yeah. So this is made from upholstery foam and silicone. Oh my God, that's crazy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Jeez. So, so what got you into this? I mean, like this is something you do for... Uh, yeah, so I do this for a living now. This is my company, Aries Legacy Creations. Yeah. I started off as a cosplayer. Uh, but now I do this full time. Most of my clients are uh, cosplayers that like to go to comic conventions. Yeah. And yeah, I used to do lots of special events too. I'm always open for that too. So. Congratulations, man. Thank this you. This is freaking amazing. You know what? Like these amazing, talented people are creating such amazing stuff. I mean, this takes time, man. Look at this. Look at all this stuff. That's some amazing work. So you guys got to hit them up, follow them, check them out. And uh, yeah, man, like see what they all are about. So we got Gabriel here and he's got some pretty cool stuff. Look at this. All the vintage stuff. All the vintage stuff. Oh, you sold the 007, eh? No, no, it's... I is it got it here. Oh, there it is. Okay. It's there now. Yeah, I got that at home. Yeah, nice. <laughs> It's amazing, it's still retained its kind of value, eh? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So, and apparently uh, Nintendo's remastering it as well. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So, Gage, so, so yeah. How, do you, how do you start this collection? You just basically start out as a collector, and uh, along the way you kind of meet friends and you kind of buy collections, and sometimes you have to sell some stuff to get other stuff for your collection. Before you know it, if, you're, if you stick with it long enough, you just end up uh, with a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, you got to get rid of it because yeah, space right? is valuable, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing, man. So, yeah. I mean, is this like also, a, a, a hobby, a passion? It's, a, it's both. It's a hobby and a passion. I also have a friend that owns a store in town. Okay. Uh, it's called Retrosaurus at 550 Concession Street. And uh, I've been known to help out there from time to time as well. So, yeah, catch me there. Yeah. I didn't bring any business cards oh, today. Okay. This is a solo project for me. Okay, okay, yeah. gotcha. Yeah. All right. So, I'll put down his link in the vlog. And okay. Maybe then you can see how many people want to go and get all these vintage retro games it's pretty cool and Arjun's still running around there but anyways Gabe thank Very you nice man. to meet you yeah anytime yeah, yeah. awesome take care enjoy the show yeah, yeah thanks man.
What's going on guys? We got Charles here and as we were talking about the first retractable photo lightsaber, check this gizmo out here. All right, my man, you gotta tell me what he did to this stuff. This, this is pretty insane. Yeah, so this is the one, the only, kind of, first. You have the Proto Saber. This is based off of a uh, concept sketch that the lead engineer Bogdan found and he did a beautiful job bringing this to life. The core of this is a stoichiometric, what's the word I'm looking for here? A stoichiometric laminar flow uh, gas bollocks. It's fine, man. I want to understand that anyways. It's fine. <laughs> the core of this is a stoichiometric glass blowing laminar flame nozzle. And all of this support hardware is just to supply gas to this in the perfect ratio. So when you toggle this switch over down here, yeah. it can open up the valves set this igniter spinning up, which I unfortunately cannot run by hand. No, that's fine. And that will get the flame to burst and then grow out to three feet long, 4,000 degrees. Oh my God. You can melt through steel plate with this. Wow, that's um, insane. Definitely keep it, you know, pointed away. Don't, pointed don't away, do the yeah, Luke Skywalker yeah. thing. Exactly. But this is one of the coolest things that's I've ever amazing, helped build. That's amazing, man. And that's actually in the Guinness World Records, right? It is. That's amazing, dude. I mean, so how long did it take for the design and everything to come through? So it's, it's difficult to measure things like that. We've been working on lightsabers since 2018, roughly. But this one itself was about one year turnaround, all in. Bogdan sat down, started designing it, got this all dealt with, figured out how to get the flow rates right, prototyped all of that out once or twice, and then finally went, put it all together in the finished, beautiful thing. And that took about a year, all in. Oh, I see, okay. And you know what? Just noticing the flame actually shooting out, it shoots perfectly straight. I mean, that's, yeah. that's like ridiculously crazy. There's, like, without, like, how is that possible? Um, so the, the magic is down to the nozzle here. This is very, very intricately designed and machined to I provide see. perfectly shaped flames that maintain their flow for a very long distance. And up to three feet, that's pretty, pretty, yeah. that's pretty insane. Now, full, full disclosure, you gotta hold it pretty steady to yeah. get it to grow oh, three I feet see. long. Oh, I see, so there's some kickback, eh, to it? Well, no, if you if you wiggle it around, the flame just sort of peters oh, out okay, after gotcha. only, only a nice, pleasant 20 inches, oh, not the full three feet. Gotcha. But. I saw this man anyways. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, no, it's, it's, this is pretty cool, man. May I, can I hold it? Is that, is that yeah, cool? Yeah, sure. Right, I'm just gonna hold it. Yeah, that's got some weight to that, for sure. Yeah. That's got some weight. I'm going to pass that back to you. Dude, thank you for your time. Hey, no worries. That's amazing. And I'm going to follow you. I'm going to put it in the... Sorry, I'm going to get there. I think it's right the, there, right? The TikTok thing here. All yeah. right, there we go. And guys, check them out, man. This is some pretty cool stuff. Come down to Retrocon. I don't know how long it's going to be running for, but this is some amazing stuff. Six o'clock. Guys, I got I to gotta introduce you to someone. Sir. What's going on, guys? Uh, Detox, aka the TMNT collector. Biggest Ninja Turtle collector, right? In Canada. In Canada. In Canada. Jeez, man, how do you start collecting all this stuff? Uh, it was, well, I'm born in 81, and uh, Ninja Turtles came out in 88 as a toy line, so I was right in that age demographic. And that's when you started? And yeah, I was really into it. I still have like uh, a lot of my childhood toys, you know, and then, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, I just like kept grabbing every Ninja Turtle thing I could find everywhere, and now it's just kind of, you know, evolved into this like... That's amazing. So yeah. how many pieces in total do you think? Um, there's probably... Uh, individual like pieces I'm gonna say I, you know what I can't even I can't even put a number 40,000 more oh more than that more. oh that's insane it's, it's that's probably insane, man. approaching like you know uh 50 ish so sooner or later you're gonna start a museum pretty much I, I'm gonna have to or yeah. buy a bigger house you know dude what it's I mean? nice meeting you my man yeah you that's too you. I'm gonna get your handle there that's your handle yeah at the TMNT collector all right. Check it out. This guy is an amazing soul. I talked to him about some amazing things about intuition. Now, any of you following your dreams, you got to listen to this guy. All right? Frederick. Yes, sir. My man. How are you? That voice. One in a million, bro. Well, thank you. And I appreciate it. 
I just want to uh, having a conversation like about years, so got, like, following your intuition mm -hmm. and moving forward yeah. in your dreams. What can like, you? What advice can you give yeah. to my viewers who are trying to follow their dreams and their journey of life? It's yours. It's your dream. Go after with everything you got. Don't let nobody deter you and tell you what you can do and what you cannot do. You can do all things because you've been blessed with that by the Creator. He gave it to you for a reason. Pursue it. Go after with everything you got. It'll all be okay. Wow, Frederick. Yes, sir. This, this is something that's very priceless. I think majority of the times people, you know, they have a gift that God has mm -hmm. given them. This is true. And, but the majority of the time is circumstance. Mm -hmm. What do you? What's your advice to people with circumstance? You know, born, you know, I guess, you know, not as capable or not as wealthy or what's your advice to them like to in order to keep going and keep trying to pursue that that little thing that they have inside them? know that the top of one mountain is the foothill of another you see so when you get to a certain place and it feels like there's nowhere else to go that just means you're at the foothill so the same energy you had to get, climb one mountain is the same energy you're going to need to climb the next and maybe even the next, and even the next. But embrace the journey. The journey is what's important. Because you're gonna, at some point in time, you're gonna have to give all of this knowledge and stuff that you're learning, you're gonna have to give that back to somebody else. So embrace it, learn as much about it as you can. When you get to your mountaintop, reach back and help somebody up to theirs. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, you know, another thing I also say is, like in my, my, the way I go about pursuing my dream as a singer, songwriter, producer, yes. um, is this too shall pass. You know, mm -hmm. I know when you're more aware of death and you see life as, you know, something that's more worth than money, mm -hmm. you tend to realize that every day that you get, is a day that you need to do something yes. for yourself. Every day above ground is a great day, man. Yeah, man. It's a, it's, and, and not only is it a great day, but it's a great day to be great. What What are your thoughts on that? Like, I mean, I know it's a very tough question to ask people sometimes, but I feel like you're a very conscious individual. <laughs> what is your views on, you know, your own imminent, you know, time? I, I make every day count. And I know people say, eh, but yeah, you can. I make a choice every day I wake up that I'm going to have a beautiful, beautiful day. This is my choice to be this. So when people say to me, you can't possibly have a great day every day. No, I don't. But that's not for you to know. So if I'm around you, my job is literally to elevate you because I'm going to be okay. I'm always going to be okay. I've always believed that. I always tell people what's hell for some is just right for me because I'm built for it. I've been through enough of the fire to know that you're gonna go through the fire. It's okay. The light at the end of the tunnel, whatever you want to call it, we all experience that. We all go through that. Those who stand the test come out on the other side a lot better than what they were before they went through. And so whatever it is that you're going through, that's a part of your journey. Embrace it. Go even further. Even further. You know, I tell my players now when they get hurt, experience the pain. If you don't know what it's like to play hurt, I mean, yeah, go yeah. see what it's like right. before you make the decision not to do it. Go see. Delve into it a little bit further. I'm not a philosophy about anything. No, man, but your words but are very lived. inspiring, man. I, I think Thank you. There's going to be a lot of people who are going to, souls who are going to meant to be seeing this, and they will see it for the message that you've given them. Thank you for being you. Oh, thank you. There's There are no accidents in my life. We met for a reason. Yes, we did. And only we can find out what that is. So if I leave today and never see you again, then we this meeting is in vain. That's right. We have to pursue it. And now that tells us what he wanted for us all along. Oh, God, you're giving me goosebumps, man. All right. Dude, you're the best. You're the best soul. No. I, I think, you know what, man? It's a very small minority of people who are very like-minded and conscious yeah. uh, about life. Positive about people are always going to find positive And people. that's exactly yes. it. I mm -hmm. think, you know, positive attracts positive, right? Yes, it does. And I feel that whatever you've accomplished in your life uh, is truly, truly a blessing for yourself. Yes, indeed. And for the people who are witnessing your blessing. Mm -hmm. So we can inspire them. Preach, in brother, life. preach. I love you, man. <laughs> Dude, I'm so glad we met. Likewise. Dude, you got to follow this guy. I think you got your Instagram handle and I everything. Do. Frederick B. Owens.
Okay, awesome. I'm going to put it down on the link there. You guys got to follow this dude. He's amazing. <laughs> Talk to you in a bit. We Thank got you. Roger Christian and the Stormtroopers walking over to the panel now. Check this out. There we go. Moving on up. But, you know, first, I, I'm going to start this off and then we'll show you uh, Roger's Galaxy of Hope trailer. But, uh, Roger, there's a burning question that Robin and I uh, have been asking is, uh, how come we found you in Toronto? How did you end up in Toronto? Um, I've made a few films in Canada. And I, my oldest friend was from Toronto, so I used to come when I was young. Okay. I used to come. So, um, you know, we kind of reached out to Roger and the first thing he did is he sent us this... Um, amazing link to this 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 new documentary called uh, galaxy built on hope um and we really gonna touch on it here today and i think rob's got the trailer queued up for everybody to watch and no two minutes okay so before we give too much away though um i'm gonna ask roger because him and i did a, a quick interview on ctv but we really haven't talked at all but how did you get involved with mr lucas how did you get involved with george like how, how do you get hired to be work on star wars because I was working in Mexico on a film called Lucky Lady, and it was written by Gloria Willard Haig, who wrote American Graffiti, and they were oh. close friends of George. And 20th Century Fox, no studio would make Star Wars. Okay. 20th Century Fox said, um, this film will make $12 million. That's all it's ever gonna do. So they said, <laughs> if you can make the film for $4 million, will give you the money. Alan Ladd said that. Okay. And they, then Britain was half the price of America. I see, okay. So then he was told by Gary Kurtz, well, the only stages free are in Britain, and if you make it there, we can maybe afford to do it. And Groening Willard said, you better come down and see what Roger and John Barry, the designer, are doing, because they're making dusty old, like, Western-like sets for Lucky Lady, exactly what you wanted. Oh, okay. So he flew down with Gary Kurtz, I was making an old salt factory. And George came and said, I'm trying to make a spaghetti western in space. And I said, oh, finally, somebody's making a science fiction movie that's old and used, because I didn't like the movies that became before that, that were all shiny and new right. and over-designed. They weren't right. And that's how it happened. I got hired then, as we were the first three people hired on Star Wars and then we went back to England and 
Fox still wouldn't give him the money. Really? And we spent four months, George, myself, Gary Kurtz, and John Barry, in a tiny studios on our own, trying to work out how I would I read the script. <laughs> are we going to make this with no money? Really? So, you, so, so this is an area I've never heard of. Okay, that's, that's crazy. And so I thought, well, John Barry, the designer, said, you know, you've got to make an R2-D2 work because there's no CGI, there was no radio right. control to make it. And then if we don't have one, George can't make the movie. So oh. I got a friend, a carpenter, he borrowed some wood from his garage, built a wooden cylinder. Right. I went around the back of an old lamp store and found a um, lamp from a 40s really? movie set that was abandoned. They'd thrown it away in the trash and it just fitted. Oh, for the dome top? Yeah. Oh, wow, okay. And then George wanted... So Art a lamp, okay. Yeah, and then <laughs> he wanted little arms on the front and the carver said, I can't make those rods. So he gave me a pen knife. I carved those at home at night. Really? And um, I stuck in the air nozzles to make it look a bit better. Right they're still there to this day, those oh. kind of details on it. And we made it walk, finally. We, we found Kenny Baker, who was three foot eight, and measuring his height from Ralph McQuarrie's painting, a C-3PO and R2-D2, he right. had to be four foot or under. Really? And Kenny Baker was the only one we could find. So we built it round him, and he finally got it to walk. Wanting to work on this project was it just everybody just bought into Only it? Only five just, of us. Yeah, but, but George, why did if he... you watch now, there's an interview with George and Christopher Nolan because he doesn't say much, George, but he right. said there were only five people actually stood by me on Star Wars and that I was one of those because I loved it. I, I was a science fiction fan, always had been, and um, I didn't like the science fiction movies they were making. They're all shiny and new and right. nothing looked real. And so I was doing what I'd always wanted to do. And we got, I got paid 150 pounds a week, it's about 300, 200 Canadian dollars a week, working seven days from <laughs> seven in the morning till 10 at night. But I was doing something and George, we became friends, you know, and his, I think his determination to do something and make it work and for children right he made them for nine-year-olds and he's always told me ever since it's not my fault adults like them as well <laughs> well i was seven when i saw it not so yeah yeah and, and it was it was mind-blowing i remember to this day yeah so i in, in i interviewed like guillermo del toro as a friend and i interviewed him for the documentary so, and he first saw it as a kid in Mexico, didn't know what it was, and he went around four times going back really? in, thinking, what is this? How can anyone make this? That inspired him to be a filmmaker. Oh, that's amazing. So is the documentary then about... It's how we made everything. The, the lightsaber, the, um, oh, the, awesome. the blasters, the pistols, R2-D2, C-3PO, the sets, the Millennium Falcon, how... Because I had no money to make anything, so... Yeah, it sounds like... It. I knew I could buy airplane junk for very little. It was no one wanted it in those days. So I bought, okay. I bought like three 16-wheel low loaders packed with jet engines, and we broke it down and I made the sets out of them. That's and they looked like real. Everyone no, kept coming I, in, going, "Wow, well, this looks like a real." There's a million ship. toys downstairs <laughs> about this thing now. Like you know, it's just it's amazing. So um, I, I was kind of, because John Barry, the designer, died. He had meningitis when he was working on Empire Strikes Back. Okay. David West Reynolds, who was the head of literature at Lucasfilm, wrote the early Star Wars books, called me one day at the ranch and said, you have to write this stuff down. No one else knows right. it. It's not in any making of documentaries, because George didn't know. I would bring him a lightsaber. I'd bring uh, him a blaster. I'd bring him this. this. You know, that's amazing. Here, use this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that's become an iconic Well, thing. he and I had the same kind of brain, so he never refused anything. That that's starting awesome. from the Stormtrooper's Blaster was the first thing I ever made, and Han Solo's gone, and I brought him over to show him, and he said, yes, that's it. And he stayed with me, and we stuck Super Groove together and made Princess Leia's gone. Super, super Glue. Super Glue. And, and you never watch the movie the same now, will you? It's full of the <laughs> Star Wars Saga has appealed to four generations of viewers since it launched in 1977. The signature look of the Star Wars used universe is the work of set decorator Roger Christian, working with designer John Barry. 
how this innovative work was created is revealed for the first time in the new documentary, Galaxy Built on Hope. Roger, you won a well-deserved Academy Award for the creation of the used universe, and it all started with this adapted submachine gun. As set deck, I had to come up with all the weapons. There was no budget to set up a special department to make any of the props or guns. And I thought, you know what? That looks pretty cool, and I, I love the sterling, the look of it. To me, it was a science fiction gun as well, that I'd adapted it correctly. That was my pet peeve, weapons that felt too light with an actor's hands and they're trying to pretend, and that's heavy. That is very heavy, it feels real. I wanted to find something that would suit a kind of tall, hairy Chewbacca. Star Wars is about taking something real, something timeless, and just giving it a little spin, adding like 10, 20 percent science fiction to it. I was intrigued by this fascinating shape, and I wondered about its origin. It's a Fijian Totopia Warriors Club. I wanted to do what I always did for everything on Star Wars, add something into it. I was in the ticket office where I had all my graphics, cameras, and one day, um, Roger Christian walked in. I brought out the graphics handle. I knew I'd found the Holy Grail. Okay, how do I turn this into what I feel would be a lightsaber? So this is the toolbox, there's his initials, William J. Harmon. The whole of the land speeders and R2-D2 were all made out of this little box in the pits that we found in the studio. So I went around scrounging work from the other productions that were hanging around. The one in Metropolis only walked forward three paces, and George tells me that they wanted it to do a lot more than they could. Ralph McQuarrie had painted c 3 with illuminated eyes. This was my biggest problem. I come up with this idea of using airplane junk and other scrap and I could stick it into the sets and make it work. Roger was highly imaginative in that respect and saved us an awful amount, a huge amount of money. Hustle. Well, there we go. We did the Q&A and my battery ran out. And my storage ran out, so that kind of sucks. Yeah. Roger, that was pretty good. Yeah. Enjoy yourself. Yeah. All right, guys, so uh, as you can see, it's done. It's such a beautiful day. Uh, we're just going to sign out now. Roger's right there. Unfortunately, I had no space on my phone, so I got to get that taken care of. But it was such a beautiful day. I hope you guys, guys enjoy the vlog. And uh, I don't know, I think we might be doing something. If you're going to do something, we might see it in the next scene, all right? But until then, take care. Wait, just when I thought the day was gonna be over, I found out there's gonna be more Q and A's. Check it out. How many of you are familiar with Atari? How many grew up playing Atari? All right. And how many grew up playing Adventure? Okay. All right. So, um, well, we'll have some time at the end for some questions too. But uh, Warren and I were kind of talking about things uh, on, on how to kind of approach this um, this talk this evening. But so really, like you know, Warren and I were kind of talking, and, and, and I said to Warren, like, why Atari? Like. So, you know, we all kind of grow up and do things and we pick places to work. And, and so I, he has a, why Atari, Warren? Why, why, did, why are we sitting here today? Like, why is an Atari the place? Okay. Um, well, so uh, I was lucky. I uh, was in the right place at the right time when I, I got a job at Atari, when the video game, video game industry was basically starting. And I was also lucky that I had very good training in computer science at uh, Rice University in Texas, and I, and 
also. I was a grad student, got a master's in computer science at Berkeley in 1976, a couple of years before I went to work at Atari. So um, uh, we were all hippies back then, <laughs> right after the Vietnam War, a beard, still wear flannel shirts. Um, uh, and Atari was full of nerdy hippies. Okay? And uh, the founder of Atari was kind of a kind of a nutty guy, Nolan Bush. Not only was a pretty good guy, he was not a control freak. He uh, he let people. Uh, you get a lot of creative freedom when you're at Atari, but it was an interesting job. Um, kind of straying off the question of why did I want to work for Atari. Uh, when I was an undergraduate and when I was a grad student, I was interested in computer graphics. Uh, I still am, that's what I did my whole career pretty much. And uh, video games are commercial computer graphics. Computer graphics just means making pictures with a computer. So video games is the first time that the American consuming public or the Canadian consuming public saw any computer generated images, really. They might have seen a little bit on TV before then, but so I just thought it, it, it was interesting stuff, making pictures with computers. It was new. Nobody knew where it was going to go. Nobody at Atari knew what video, how much video games were going to change. If you'd said that video games were going to outsell movies and recorded music, come on, they would have just laughed you out of the room back in the, the late 70s, but it's that's what happened. Um, so, uh, after I uh, finished my degree at Berkeley and goofed off for a year building log cabins and spent all my money, I decided to go back to California and get a job in Silicon Valley. And uh, so I got three offers. One was from Atari to design video games, which seemed pretty interesting. But uh, the one that really interested me was my dream job, design, writing software for printers at Hewlett Packard. <laughs> you believe that? That was not my dream job. Okay, that sounded boring. <laughs> Getting to design uh, video games sounded interesting. I didn't really know exactly what it meant, but it sounded kind of open-ended and new. So that's the job I chose. So. When I was back in my hometown, which is Springfield, Missouri, I had met a guy who repaired pinball machines, and he told me about a new company in California that made a new kind of game. The company was called Atari, and they were in Sunnyvale, California. He'd seen a few of their games, and so I recognized that that was computer graphics, and so I thought I would just I would go look them up when I got to California. So I had no connections. I showed up at the front desk and filled out a job application. And I wrote a one paragraph uh, little speech explaining why I was a perfect employee for them. <laughs> and it worked. And was it the hippie part? Or was it like the, the whole? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot. So, you know, I talked. There's a lot of rumors flying around that to work at Atari was like to be stoned 24 7 or the parties. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, you know, I mean, there, I mean, Howard Scott Warshaw, who unfortunately can't be because we have really poor technology in this building, um, this evening, you know, wrote his latest book and he talks about, you know, it's just a party place, the Google of, the modern Google of the 70s, but you and I... That part say, might be true. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, in my experience at Atari, which I was there from 1977 to 1979, people weren't uh, stoned when they were designing video games. That might be what you imagine when you look at the goofy graphics of some of the games, <laughs> but it was hard to design uh, Atari video games. It, there were a lot of limitations, tiny little memories, processors weren't very powerful, there was a weird little chip you had to program, it was something called real-time programming, which is really difficult, and the limited memories is called resource-limited programming. So you were, you were squeezed in, it was hard. And, you couldn't have, you could not have, you, you couldn't do it when you're stoned. It's too difficult. <laughs> I'm not saying we never drank alcohol or got stoned. I'm saying we didn't do it when we were working on the software. But so, <laughs> no, I never saw it once. 
Um, I'm not saying we were well behaved. My, my office mate, we came to work whenever we wanted, and some people handled that freedom better than others. My office mate went to the beach every Wednesday. He played hooky one day per week, and nobody called him on it. I don't know, I don't think they even knew he wasn't there. So, it, uh, but the, in general, uh, the game designers at Atari, we were called, we called ourselves engineers. And engineers at Atari liked their jobs. They liked, part of the reason they liked is because they were given creative freedom by Bushnell to invent. Nobody knew what video games were gonna become. You had the freedom to come up with an idea. If you were in the coin-op division, which made the arcade games, that was done by small teams, and you had to convince your teammates, maybe, that your idea was a good one. But in the consumer division that I was in, uh, it was one person, one game, so you didn't have to convince anybody. If you had an idea, you could just start coding it up. And that was pretty amazing creative freedom. And creative freedom doesn't just happen spontaneously. You're lucky if you find a place where you're allowed to have some freedom. And I know you were talking. We were talking about like there's no working with the Atari was 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 revolutionary in the sense that there's no book to follow. Like you, it was about trial and error or pushing it to it to its limits. Like there was no review of your code or like you kind of. It was like the Wright brothers. There was no book you could read to, that told you how to make a machine that would fly. There were a lot of different inventors that were trying it. The Wright Brothers Museum is in North Carolina, where I live, by the way, so I've been there. It's pretty cool. And they concentrated on steering gliders so they could control it before they put an engine on it. There were some other guys that concentrated on having a strong engine, and that was necessary, maybe, but the way that uh, things went with the strong engine guys was the first test flight, it went... <laughs> It didn't last longer than a minute in the air before it had gone out of control and crashed and killed the pilot. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but I think it's a good comparison between learning to fly and learning how to make video games. Nobody know, knew what was possible. You didn't get killed if your game didn't work, though. <laughs> so you made three games, right? Three three cartridges, right? Mm -hmm. one, was, one was basic. Basic programming. One was Slot Racers, Slot and racers. then of course Adventure. Adventure. Do you have? So we're going to show you, for those of you who have not played Atari, shame on you, but anyways, <laughs> um, you should, uh, Robin's going to bring up Slot Racers. Yeah. So this, you can tell us what's going on. The reason that I want to put this up here is because it shows you how crude the graphics were on the Atari 2600. So those, those two th things there are cars. Uh, and in a second, they'll start shooting missiles at one another. So this is a game about two cars in a maze shooting missiles at each other. And uh, creator freedom. <laughs> and the graphics resources you had were two two good sprites, and you're seeing them on the screen right now. And three crude sprites. That's missiles. So you're seeing four or five sprites that were available. And then there's a crude low resolution background, the maze. That's all you have on the Atari 2600. And people could make games out of five sprites and a background. And there were quite a few, there were a number of examples of published games already by the time I got there. There were eight, in fact, that were, uh, had been published when I started work at Atari. So, now, another thing about Atari is you kind of had to do one game, even if it wasn't very good, before you understood how to program the Atari 2600. So that was my learning game. It, in most situations in an industry, you wouldn't uh, get a chance to... <laughs> your, your learning game wouldn't be published, but at that time Atari published everything we made. So. It was kind of an average game from that time in the 
game industry. It was playable. It, it, the concept's directly from you, though, right? Like, you, yeah. You, yeah, it's right. You come up with the concept beginning mm -hmm. to end and finish doing the whole thing. Yeah, game. my working title was traffic. I got the idea when I was driving to work. And <laughs> I, I, imagined, I imagined there were going to be police cars chasing me and uh, some other things. But then I ran into the memory limits, and you just couldn't. There wasn't room for police cars, but you could say it was a very, very early crude version of uh, uh, Grand Theft Auto. Yeah. Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. Okay. Um, very crude. Early. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then, like you know, I think everybody who's played adventure understands adventure, but in a sense, like so, adventure is like the game that you know I'm, I'm kind of you're known for and. Um, where did the concept come from? Yeah, so um, when I was working on slot racers that you just saw, uh, so that was in my first five months at Atari. It took me five months to make that game. And, and after having done a complete game, I made, I made the graphics, I made the sound effects, I had the concept and then turned it into working computer code. I debugged it, I tested it on kids. Uh, so I'd gone through the whole process. Uh, so I lived in a group house with some other 20-something nerdy hippies in, uh, in uh, Menlo Park, California, near Stanford University. And one of my housemates, who, who was actually a pretty old friend of mine at that point, Julius Smith, took me over to where he worked at Stanford. It was the start Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab. And we played this game that everybody was playing at that time. It was, it was the first text adventure game. It's called Colossal Cave nowadays. How many of you know what a text adventure game is? Right, everybody. So it, a text adventure game is a game where there's no graphics or sounds. It's all text. You type a text command, and then it, it gives you back a description of where you are and what's happened, and then you type another text command. So uh, you, you might start out, and it says you're in, you're in front of a well house from which flows a, a little spring. And before you on the ground are some keys and uh, a bottle of water. And then you can say, take keys. And it says, okay. And then you say, take water. And it says, okay. And then, if you, and then you say, enter well spring, well house. And it says, you're inside a well house. Water's bubbling up out of the well and blah, blah, blah. And then, and there's, there's a loaf of bread on the floor. So you can say, take loaf. Okay, and then leave well house. You're outside the well house. Go south. You're walking alongside a stream flowing down a rocky bed. Go south. The water flows into a hole in the ground through a steel grate. The grate is locked. Okay, so you can move around in the game world by giving commands. You can pick things up that you run into, and at this point you run into an obstacle. So if you say, go down, it says, you can't go through a lock steel grate, okay? And then once you understand how it works, you have to go find objects in the game world and get past obstacles, and you pick, already picked up the key, so you can say inventory, and it says, you're carrying some keys, a loaf of bread, and a bottle of water. And, uh, and it might take you a lot of experimentation to figure out, the, in this case, this is the very first puzzle. It's pretty obvious that maybe the keys would open the grate. So you, if you think of saying, Unlock grate, and it says the grate is open. And then you said go down, and it says you are in an underground passage with light uh, shining in from above. And so and then you can then you can go further into the cave. Okay, most of this game takes place in the cave. Well, all right, maybe that's kind of a long-winded description, but it was a game where uh, there was a, a world to be explored. And there were things in the world you could pick up and then later use to get past obstacles. And, uh, and there maybe even were some monsters further back in there that you might have to fight. But it was all done with text, all right? Text commands, text descriptions coming back to you, the player. So I just finished my first video game, or I was about to finish it. I was looking for a new idea. And that blew my mind. Julius and I sat there for a few hours playing this, this text adventure game, but I decided right then that was what I was gonna do on the Atari video game. I was gonna make an adventure game, but using graphics and animation and sound. 
And, and so, I, well, no, okay. <laughs> But there were some there were problems. Yeah, so, so this was the time when Bushnell left then, was it? Is that no, how? No, no. Was, he was still, he got to well, he wasn't, to do it or? Nolan Bushnell had sold the company to get the capital to make a play at uh, making home video games. Oh, okay. Took a lot of money to, Warner Communications actually invested a hundred million dollars oh, right. to launch the Atari video game system. And they had controlling interest, and uh, Nolan Bushnell had so Nolan Bushnell owned 51 percent of Atari or something like that. So he had gotten 17 million dollars the year before he joined Atari. So he wasn't that involved with the company anymore. He he cashed out, and he also didn't actually have control anymore. He was still the CEO. Oh, okay. And so you're you're in Nolan Bushnell was kind of a wild guy. Explain, he, okay, you can't drop that and say. Well, he'd come to work wearing a t-shirt that said, I like to fuck. <laughs> Imagine the CEO. <laughs> it was California, but I mean. <laughs> they'd hold um, board meetings in his hot tub. A lawyer shows up from New York. There are three of the board members out of five. It's a quorum. They start slapping the water to, as if it was a gavel. That's awesome. See, so these, the, the lawyer from New York was not impressed. <laughs> um, but Adventure kind of turned into a bit of a secret project for you, right? It, it didn't really, people weren't really, really loving it with an Atari. Um, yeah. So the story is uh, um, I had a very good boss when I started at Atari. His name was Larry Kaplan. He was one of the four game designers at Atari that a couple of years later quit Atari and started a competing company called Activision, which is still around and it's pretty big and successful. And um, he uh, had already made two video, Atari 2600 video games. He knew what it took. He got me started. He gave me a listing for combat, the cartridge that came in the box with the Atari 2600, as an example to study. He gave me the manual for the weird little chip inside of the, the uh, 2600 console, and he gave me a, a, a programmer's manual for the processor, 6502. So this stack of stuff was, you know, three quarters of an inch thick. It, it, it wasn't that too much information. It was just the right stuff to get me started, and I. I I had a few questions. I think he would answer my questions. He didn't bug me. He wanted to be working on his own game, actually, which is why he didn't bug me. But he, he knew his stuff. He, he knew what it took to design a game. But, uh, and then around this time, he had eight people working for him, and he had no time to work on his own game. So he, he asked his boss if he could hire somebody to, to take over the job he was doing. He wanted to go back to just being a game designer. Uh, and so they hired this guy, but he, uh, he didn't know anything about video games. He, he'd come from Lockheed. He was about 30 years older than the rest of us. He was not a hippie. He was very straight. He thought that engineers should do what the higher management told them to do. He didn't really get what it was like at Atari. So uh, I had set to work uh, to do this idea that I had when I was at the Stanford AI lab to, to implement this adventure game as an Atari 2600 game. And, I'd already figured out how to do it, basically. I mean, to, how to use those resources. I was gonna use one of those little sprites as the thing that represented you, what we call the avatar today, one of the low resolution sprites. And I was gonna use the two high resolution sprites to represent objects in the game world. And I was gonna use the maze background to represent walls in the room you were in that constrained where you could go. That worked great, eventually. But, so I'd already solved the problem of how to use the graphics resources to represent a, a video game version of an adventure game. And uh, <clears throat> George, my new boss, uh, he heard that I was working on trying to make an adventure. He knew that it ran on a mainframe, and, then it, and the, the mainframe program required 100K of memory, but the Atari system only had 4K of memory. So, from that basis, he concluded it was impossible, and he came into my office and said, yeah, I hear you're working on adventure. And I said, yeah, or something, I don't know exactly what he said. He just told me, it's impossible. Stop working on it. 
Good so, boss. Yeah. Huh? Good boss. <laughs> he, he didn't ask me how I was going to, how I planned to do it, which is what he should have asked me. He didn't really understand <clears throat> how things worked at Atari. He was kind of out of his depth. But anyway, he forbid me to do it. So what do you think I did? <laughs> did it anyway. Did it anyway. That's exactly right. That's exactly what I said, actually. So I did it anyway. Um, what I did was I, I started working on it in secret. So George came to work from 9 to 5. Most, most of the game designers showed up at 11 or 12. <laughs> and some of them worked into the... I, I worked pretty hard, actually. I would work into the night until at least seven, sometimes eight or nine. So um, I just work on it. I plan things at my desk during the day and then I go uh, <clears throat> to the development system and work on it at night. And so I thought that I needed to make a feasibility demonstration to educate George and show him that it actually was feasible. I'd already had it half working. So I, I worked pretty hard for about a month and when I showed him my feasibility demonstration, which had about six rooms and two objects, you could pick them up and move around, and it had some walls that you could run into, and it had one creature, a dragon, that would chase you around, but when it caught you, nothing happened. But it would chase you from room to room. This is enough to show that the idea of a multi-room game with objects you could pick up was feasible. So when I showed it to him, he was mad. <laughs> he was pissed off that I had <coughs> ignored his command to stop, and it didn't seem to make any impact on him that uh, it, it was feasible. <laughs> but, so, so how did you get the green light to go keep going on it then? Like how did he yeah. was mad, but he thought, oh, what else sell? Well, I, I sort of had cognitive dissonance. I, I, I guess I'm uh, not the world's greatest type of employee. I just didn't do what I was told. I, I thought I had a good idea. And he was he was crushing my good idea. And uh, so I was confused. And I was demoralized. So what I actually did was I went on vacation for a month, even though I only had two weeks of vacation. <laughs> and he sent me to the HR people and she said, we don't hold jobs at Atari. I went anyway. I went back to Texas where my college friends were, and I went back to Missouri where my family was. And, and a month later, I came back to California. I didn't know if I would still have a job at the time or not, but I went into my office, and my stuff was still there on the desk. So, uh, And what happened in the meantime was George showed my prototype to the marketing department, and they liked it because it was different, whatever that means, but it was different. It, had a game world that was bigger than one screen, even though not much happened in it yet. But Warner Communications, the parent company, owned the Superman movie that was supposed to come out later that year. And, and so marketing told me that I had to turn it into a game about Superman. Okay. But that meant I could keep working on it. All right. And I was working on the guts of the game, not the part where you put in the little blue and red guys with waving capes, but just kind of the underlying mechanics of the whole thing. So every time we had, we had a meeting, maybe once every two weeks, we mostly just sat in our offices and worked on our game, okay? They were solo projects, and nobody bothered you most of the time. So anyway, every time the Superman game thing came up, I would say, well, I'll do that if I have to, but what I really want to do is work on the Dungeons and Dragons idea. And about the fourth time I said this, my coworker John Dunn spoke up and said, hey, I'll take over your code and turn it into Superman and you can keep working on your idea. And I said, okay. And George was sort of glaring at me on the other end of the table, but because I was once again not doing what I was told. So this game, roll the clock forward two, three years, it sold 1.3 million copies at 20, Five dollars a piece retail. That's thirty million dollars. Okay. Now Atari had promised me a royalty when I interviewed ten cents per cartridge. Okay. But Warner took it away. They didn't. They just ignored the promises that the uh, old guard had made. So 
getting a little bit ahead of my story, but I'm telling you the sales numbers to tell you that it was a good idea. My boss was telling me it's impossible. And I showed him it's feasible, he's still mad at me. The marketing department wants me to turn it into something else. So what I say is I navigated the political currents in order to be able to actually do what I wanted to do. The, um, and I didn't know this was going to happen. I just thought it was a good idea. And I, uh, and I didn't like boneheads telling me what to do. <laughs> so, and it's interesting now, right? Because so if you play a video game now, everybody gets credited at the end when you finish the game. But back then, yeah. nobody got In addition credited. to taking away my royalty, they wouldn't, they didn't, this wasn't just something they did to me. It was across the board. They didn't want to give any public credit to the game designer. And uh, there, it was a blanket policy. It didn't, wasn't much I could, seemed to be much I could do about it. But by the time I got to the end of the game, after it was quite, a, it was pretty hard to implement too. Just having the idea of I'm going to make an adventure game on the 2600 is not enough. You have to come up with some creatures and things and uh, obstacles and tools and that can be implemented in a tiny little 4K memory. This was not easy to do at all. Uh, what was the question I'm answering? I, the question was, you got no credit for something oh, you right. got credit for now. Well, I'm getting ahead of my story, but okay. <laughs> so maybe I'll go back and talk about how, how I implemented the game, but um, this is part of the political story. I realized after a while that uh, get credit for my game. I'm making the whole thing. I'm making the graphics. I'm making the sounds. I'm making the code. I'll just make a secret room that's really hard to get into and then put my name in there. <laughs> so I did. And it's because it was what, this type of game, it turns out it's really easy to make a secret place. I already had three castles with keys that opened the doors. So, the, you know, you couldn't get into the castle till you got the key to open the door, okay? So I just made sort of another castle with a different kind of t key, but it wasn't a castle. It was just a secret room, and there was a wall you couldn't get through. But if you got the secret key, which was a dot, one pixel in size, that was the same color as the floor, so it was invisible unless you ran into it. If you ran into it, it made the pickup sound, and then you knew you picked up something, and then... So the, the smart kids, one, a few smart kids eventually figured this out and got into the secret room. And what was in the secret <coughs> room was created by Warren Robinette in flashing colors. And there's, there's, Tari had no idea until he got there. Right. Well, yeah. So I'll tell you, <laughs> well, I'll tell you my internal dialogue. I had this idea. And I, I implemented it. It wasn't that hard to implement. I was almost finished with adventure. I just put one more object in it that was the text of my signature, and I put it in the hard to get to place. And then I was tempted to tell my two buddies there at Atari, Jim Heather and Tom Ruderdahl, but then the little devil appeared on my shoulder and said, okay, Warren, if you, t if you can't keep the secret yourself, how can you expect Tom and Jim to keep the secret? The little devil is right frequently, you know. <laughs> so that, that seemed to be good advice. So I didn't tell anybody. And, uh, and I quit after I handed in the game. There was George. I went and told him, well, okay. It was April 1979. I handed in Adventure. Here's, here's the final code for Adventure, George. He passes it on, and it's, it's got the data in it that's going to get put onto the ROM, the read-only memory chip in the cartridge, okay? And then about uh, two weeks later, I just was feeling un unappreciated and demoralized. <laughs> he, he was going to sell a million copies, but George is treating me like uh, a bad employee. I told him I was quitting. He smiled. <laughs> Big smile. <laughs> but uh, I just stared at him. 
I knew I was gonna get the last laugh. So they ship out, I don't know how many thousands of cartridges went before. Well, I don't know exactly, but let's say it's, they manufactured 200,000 cartridges and shipped them all over the world. And then they're not gonna get the genie back in the bottle, are they? And um, later that year, there was a 15-year-old kid in Salt Lake City who found a secret, not only found a secret room, but he wrote a letter to Atari with some maps and diagrams and showed exactly how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and you gotta remember, there's no internet back then, so nobody's sharing it, right? So I can't even imagine opening this up and thinking, well, reading it and going, the, what the, the hell? The internet back then was called the playground. The playground, okay. Well, how do you tell people, yeah, well, other kids yeah. on the playground? Well, it's I didn't know where you're going for a minute. I'm so used to being online, but no, yeah, I get it. The playground. The room. room. Yeah. I mean, the kids told each other, "Hey, you played this." I'm making this up, but they it was a good secret. They told each other. The word spread, which is amazing to me, right? So you got this. Ernie Klein, the author of Ready Player right. One, when he was eight years old, played adventure, found the secret room, realized that it was a message from the person who created it, and then 30 years went by, and then he became a science fiction author, and he and used that idea, an Easter egg, in the plot of his novel, Ready Player One, which then got made into a movie. Yeah, and, it, and that's, you know, you know, it really pisses me off. I'm 52 and I haven't found that thought yet. But anyways, <laughs> he's eight years old. But anyways, he, so they ship out all his cartridges. Clearly, they can't take it back. I mean, it's there now. Like, it's there forever. And I can't like, punish me either, because I don't work there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> And I can't take away my royalty because they already took away my royalty. Right, and then, like I said, yeah. So then, it, then it travels around, and people start picking up on it. And then Atari comes out and says, "This is a good idea." This is from what I read. Said we're going to start putting Easter eggs in all games. Right now, like every well, yeah, so, uh, one thing that happened was uh, George, the guy who told me it was impossible, got fired in the, the year between when I quit and when they discovered the Easter egg. There was a new guy who was head of the game designers named Steve Wright, and he had no dog in that fight, and so I didn't work there anymore, so I didn't have to be punished. So he decided that, he was just kind of thinking about it, and he decided that hidden surprises in video games was a good thing. It's like hunting for the colored eggs on Easter morning under the bushes and flowers. So Steve Wright called it an Easter egg. I call it my signature. <laughs> so now, so now with like like and you touched on Ernest Klein, or you, or you call him Ernie Klein, but Ernest Klein's book Ready Player One. If you've seen the movie, like I said, it really brings back the idea. Uh, well, I mean, eventually he plays it at the beginning of the book. I've read it multiple times, and and then he plays it again at the very end of the book to finish the game. Right? Was that a research for you? Like, was that? Like when you, uh, uh, first of all, I don't even know if you read Ready Player One or how. Well, that's how people it. decide what's important in the United States is if you see it on television on a movie screen. <laughs> yeah, it ma made it more important, definitely. A sense of pride and like you know, hey, look, like you know, thirty years. Well, I already knew it was pretty good, but it was sort of fun to get credit. I got to know Ernie a bit because he came to Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where I live, and I had lunch with him two or three years before the movie came out. Actually, it takes a long time, but, but he had a contract with, uh, he had published the book Ready Player One, and it was seven years from when he, when, from when he published the book to when the movie came out. Right. And, and the contract for making a movie was, I know that this part of the story, he had an agent, and she held an auction with the book publishers, and bidding kind of went up on the book so it seemed to be a hot property and then he got he was he wasn't wealthy but he had a pretty good deal for his this wasn't his first book it was his second right. book. Okay. so he he got this much money on the monday let's say and then the very next day there was a bidding war amongst the studios for the movie rights and he got this much money the next day because there's Way more money in the movie, and then from there it took seven years before the movie was made. And I got to know him in the interval. Right, and the movie was directed and produced by Steven Spielberg. Uh -huh. Yeah, and uh, so Ernie got uh, uh, my wife and I tickets to the pr premiere. So we were there uh, in Hollywood when the That's movie cool. premiered. 
So that's, so that's pretty fun. I've never gone to a Hollywood premiere before. They had a red carpet. <laughs> <laughs> and so I walked up to the security guards and said, I would probably know if I was supposed to walk on the red carpet, wouldn't I? And he said, yes, you would. <laughs> <laughs> for the actors. That's awesome. <laughs> um, did, um, oh, see, that made me lose my train of thought. That was a good question, I thought. Um, so, do you, oh, so we talked about this before. I, I said to him, I said, are you still got an Atari? And your answer is, you still have an Atari, right? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I have the same one that I tested my games on 40 years ago. They last. It's still working. And one thing I never asked you is, do you still talk to some of your old friends from the Atari days, or? Um, well, I have one friend that keep up. Oh, nice. Yeah. Very nice. I mean, it's 40 years is a long time. Okay, all right, let's skip age, okay? We're doing kind <laughs> of... Um, is there any questions for the audience on, on, for Warren here on making an adventure? Yes? I'm just, just curious if you uh, still program for fun or... Anything. Still program for fun? Yeah. Um, I still program for uh, for fun. Yeah, sort of. I mean, I, pro I work on the projects I want to work on, so yeah, I still program for fun. What kind of things do you do? What kind of things do I do? Work, yeah, like what kind of things do you program? Um, well, I'm working on kind of a math project with a friend of mine who's at MIT. It's, it's kind of a long shot project refuting a famous theorem. I don't think I want to get into the details. Yeah, that's, that's a long jump from an adventure game where you're riding around killing yeah. dragons, right? Yeah. Um, this is a question I saw online and I thought, it's very interesting. Did it ever bother you that the dragons look like ducks? Like, first of all, for me, being a seven-year-old kid, I thought it was the most amazing like, thing to see. You know, you pick a